charge to the lodge. And now, my brethren, let us see to it, and so regulate our lives by the plumb lines of justice, ever squaring our actions by the square of virtue, that when the Grand Warden of Heaven may call for us, we may be found ready. Let us cultivate assiduously the noble tenets of our profession. Brotherly love, relief, and truth. And, from the square, learn morality. From the level, equality. From the plumb, rectitude of life. Let us imitate, in all his various perfections, him who, when assailed by the murderous band of rebellious craftsmen, maintained his integrity, even in death, and sealed his pled with his own blood. Let us emulate his amiable and virtuous conduct, his unfeigned piety to his God, his inflexible integrity to his trust. And as the evergreen that bloomed at the head of the grave be, tokened the place of his interment, so may virtue's ever-blooming loveliness designate us as free and accepted masons. With the trowel, spread liberally the cement of brotherly love and affection. And, circumscribed by the compass, let us ponder well our words and actions, and let all the energies of our minds and the affections of our souls be employed in the attainment of our supreme grand warden's approbation. Thus, when dissolution draws nigh, and the cold winds of death come sighing around us, and his chilly dews already glisten on our foreheads, with joy shall we obey the summons of the Grand Warden of Heaven, and go from our labors on earth to everlasting refreshments in the paradise of God. Then, by the benefit of the pass, a pure and blameless life, with a firm reliance on divine providence, shall we gain ready admission into that celestial lodge above, where the Supreme Grand Warden forever presides, forever reigns. When, placed at his right hand, he will be pleased to pronounce us just and upright masons, then shall we be fitted as living stones for that spiritual temple, that house not made with hands, it's an all in the heavens, where no discordant voice shall be heard, but all the soul shall experience shall be perfect bliss, and all it shall express shall be perfect praise, and love divine shall ennoble every heart, and hallelujahs exalted employ every tongue. The master gives one rap with his gavel, when all take their seats except the candidate, who remains standing before the master, by whom he is addressed as follows, Worshipful Master. Brother Gab, in closing this degree, I now give you the following. Charge. Brother, your zeal for the institution of masonry, the progress you have made in the mystery, and your conformity to our regulations, have pointed you out as a proper object for our favor and esteem. You are now bound by duty, honor, and gratitude, to be faithful to your trust, to support the dignity of your character on every occasion, and to enforce, by precept and example, obedience to the tenets of the order. In the character of a master mason, you are authorized to correct the errors and irregularities of your uninformed brethren, and to guard them against a breach of fidelity. To preserve the reputation of the fraternity unsullied must be your constant care. And, for this purpose, it is your province to recommend to your inferiors obedience and submission to your equals, courtesy and affability, to your superiors, kindness and condescension, universal benevolence you are always to cultivate, and, by the regularity of your own behavior, afford the best example for the conduct of others less informed. The ancient landmarks of the order, entrusted to your care, you are carefully to preserve, and never suffer them to be infringed, or countenance a deviation from the established usages and customs of the fraternity. Your virtue, honor, and reputation are concerned in supporting with dignity the character you now bear. Let no motive, therefore, make you swerve from your duty, violate your vows, or betray your trust. But be true and faithful, and imitate the example of that celebrated artist whom you this evening represent. Thus you will render yourself deserving of the honor which we have conferred, and merit the confidence we have reposed. Worshipful Master. Brother Gab. You will now take your seat in this lodge as a master mason, after stepping to the secretary's desk, and signing your name to the constitution and bylaws, which will then make you a member of this lodge. There is a lecture to this degree, as well as in the other degrees, but it is not generally given by the master to the candidate on the night of his raising. The candidate generally gets this from some of the brethren who are well posted in the work. This degree is very lengthy and to give the lecturate an initiation would take up too much of the night. But if there is time, the master and senior warden usually go through with the first section before closing the lodge, so that the candidate and brethren may become conversant with it. The lecture is as follows, 
First section. Question. Are you a master mason? Answer. I am. Question. What induced you to become a master mason? Answer. In order that I might travel in foreign countries, work and receive master's wages, being better enabled to support myself and family, and contribute to the relief of worthy distressed master masons, their widows and orphans. Question. What makes you a master mason? Answer. My obligation. Question. Where were you made a master mason? Answer. In a regularly constituted lodge of masons. Question. How were you prepared? Answer. By being divested of all metals, neither naked nor clothed, barefoot nor shod, hoodwinked, with a cable toe three times around my body, in which condition I was conducted to the door of the lodge by a brother. Question. Why had you a cable toe three times around your body? Answer. To signify that my duties and obligations become more and more binding as I advance in masonry. Question. How gained you admission? Answer. By three distinct knocks. Question. To what do they allude? Answer. To the three jewels of a master mason, which are friendship, morality, and brotherly love. Question. What was said to you from within? Answer. Who comes here? Question. Your answer? Answer. Brother Gab, who has been regularly initiated empty the apprentice, passed to the degree of fellow craft, and now wishes further light in masonry, by being raised to the sublime degree of a master mason. Question. What were you then asked? Answer. If it was of my own free will and accord, if I was worthy and well qualified, duly and truly prepared, had made suitable proficiency in the preceding degree, and was properly vouched for. All which being answered in the affirmative, I was asked by what further right or benefit I expected to gain admission. Question. What followed? Answer. I was directed to wait with patience until the worshipful master should be informed of my request, and his answer returned. Question. What answer did he return? Answer. Let him enter, and be received in due form. Question. How were you received? Answer. On both points of the compasses, extending from my naked left to my right breast, which was to teach me that, as the most vital parts of man are contained within the breast, so the most excellent tenets of our institution are contained between the points of the compasses, which are friendship, morality, and brotherly love. Question. How were you then disposed of? Answer. I was conducted three times around the lodge, to the junior warden in the south where the same questions were asked, and like answers returned as at the door. Question. How did the junior warden dispose of you? Answer. He directed me to the senior warden in the west, and he to the worshipful master in the east, where the same questions were asked, and like answers returned as before. Question. How did the worshipful master dispose of you? Answer. He ordered me to be returned to the senior warden in the west who taught me to approach the east by three upright regular steps, my feet forming the angle of a perfect square, my body erect at the altar, before the worshipful master in the east. Question. What did the worshipful master do with you? Answer. He made me a master mason in due form. Question. What was that due form? Answer. Kneeling on both my naked knees, both hands resting on the holy Bible, square, and compasses, in which due form I took the solemn oath of a master mason, which is as follows, here give the obligation. But it is never required. Being only a matter of form. Question. After the obligation, what were you asked? Answer. What I most desired. Question. Your answer? Answer. Further light in masonry. Question. Did you receive it? Answer. I did by order of the worshipful master and the assistance of the brethren. Question. On being brought to light, what did you discover more than you had heretofore discovered? Answer. Both points of the compass is elevated above the square, which was to teach me never to lose sight of those truly Masonic virtues, which are friendship, morality, and brotherly love. Question. What did you then discover? Answer. The worshipful master approaching me from the east under the due regard of a master mason, who, in token of further continuance of his brotherly love and favor, presented me with his right hand, and with it the pass and token of the pass of a master mason, and ordered me to arise and salute the junior and senior wardens as such. 
Question. After saluting the wardens, what did you first discover? Answer. The worshipful master, who ordered me to the senior warden in the west, who taught me how to wear my apron as a master mason. Question. How should a master mason wear his apron? Answer. With the flap and corners turned down, which is to distinguish him as a master mason, or an overseer of the work. Question. After being taught to wear your apron as a master mason, how were you then disposed of? Answer. I was conducted to the worshipful master in the east, who presented me with the working tools of a master mason, which are all the implements of masonry indiscriminately, but more especially the trowel. Question. What is the use of these tools? Answer. The trowel is an instrument made use of by operative masons to spread the cement, which unites a building into one common mass. But we, as free and accepted masons, are taught to make use of it for the more noble and glorious purpose of spreading the cement of brotherly love and affection, etc., etc. Question. How were you then disposed of? Answer. I was ordered to be returned to the place from whence I came, and reinvested of what I had been divested of and wait the worshipful master's will and pleasure. Second section. Question. What does a master's lodge represent? Answer. The unfinished sanctum sanctorum, or holy of holies, of King Solomon's temple. Question. Did you ever return to the lodge? Answer. I did. Question. On your return to the lodge, where were you placed? Answer. In the center, where I was caused to kneel, and implore the blessings of deity. Question. After imploring the blessings of deity, what followed? Answer. I arose, and on my passage around the lodge was accosted by three fellow crafts, who thrice demanded of me the secrets of the master mason. And, on being refused, the first gave me a blow with the twenty-four inch gauge, across my throat. The second with a square, across my breast. The third with a setting maul, on my forehead, which felled me on the spot. Question. What did you then represent? Answer. Our Grand Master, Hiram Abiff, who was slain just before the completion of King Solomon's temple. Question. Was his death premeditated? Answer. It was, by fifteen fellow crafts, who, seeing the temple about to be completed, and being desirous of obtaining the secrets of the Master Mason, whereby they might travel in foreign countries, work, and receive Master's wages entered into a horrid conspiracy to extort them from our Grand Master, Hiram Abiff, or take his life. But, reflecting with horror on the atrocity of the crime, twelve of them recanted. The other three persisted in their murderous designs. Question. At what hour was our Grand Master, Hiram Abiff, slain? Answer. At high twelve. Question. How came he to be assassinated at that hour? Answer. It was his usual practice at high twelve, while the craft were called from labor to refreshment, to enter into the unfinished sanctum sanctorum, or holy of holies of the temple, and there to offer up his adorations to deity, and there to draw his designs on the trestle board. Question. Who were the murderers? Answer. The three fellow crafts who persisted in their murderous designs, knowing this to be his usual practice, placed themselves at the south, west and east gates of the inner courts of the temple, and there awaited his return. Question. What followed? Answer. Our Grand Master, Hiram Abiff, having finished his usual exercises, attempted to retire at the south gate, where he was accosted by Jubella, who thrice demanded of him the secrets of the Master Mason, or the Master's word. And, on being refused, gave him a blow with the twenty-four-inch gauge across the throat, upon which he fled and attempted to pass out at the west gate, where he was accosted by Jubello, who, in like manner, thrice demanded of him the secrets of the master mason, or the master's word, and, on his being refused, gave him a blow with a square across his breast, upon which he fled, and attempted to make his escape out at the east gate, where he was accosted by Jubalum, who, in like manner, thrice demanded of him the secrets of the master mason, or the master's word, and, on his being refused, gave him a violent blow with a setting maul, on his forehead, which felled him dead on the spot. Question. What did they do with the body? Answer. They buried it in the rubbish of the temple until low twelve, or twelve at night, when they met by agreement and carried it a westerly course from the temple, to the brow of a hill west of Mount Mori, 
where they buried it in a grave dug due east and west, six feet perpendicular, at the head of which they planted an acacia, in order to conceal it, and that the place might be known, should acacia never require. And then made their escape. Question. When was our Grand Master, Hiram Abiff, found to be missing? Answer. On the following day. Question. How was his absence discovered? Answer. By there being no designs drawn on the trestle board. Question. What followed? Answer. King Solomon, being informed of this, supposed him to be indisposed, and ordered strict search to be made for him through the several apartments of the temple, and due inquiry made. Search and inquiry were accordingly made, but he could I not be found. Question. What followed? Answer. King Solomon, fearing some accident had befallen him, ordered the several rolls of the workmen to be called. And, after roll call, it was found that three craftsmen were missing, namely, Jubella, Jubello, and Jubilum, who, from the similarity of their names, were supposed to be brothers, and men from Tyre. Question. What followed? Answer. At this time, the twelve fellow crafts, who had recanted from their murderous designs, appeared before King Solomon, clothed in white gloves and aprons, in token of their innocence, acknowledging their premeditated guilt, and humbly imploring his pardon. Question. What followed? Answer. King Solomon ordered them to divide in parties, and travel three east, three west, three north, and three south, with others whom he should appoint, in search of the ruffians. Question. What followed? Answer. The three, as they were passing a westerly course, coming down near the port of Joppa, met a seafaring man, of whom they inquired if he had seen any strangers pass that way. He informed them that he had seen three, who, from their appearance, were workmen from the temple, seeking a passage into Ethiopia. But, not having King Solomon's pass, were unable to obtain one, and had returned back into the country. Question. What followed? Answer. They returned and bore this intelligence to King Solomon, who ordered them to divide themselves, and travel as before, with positive instructions to find the ruffians, and with as positive assurance, that if they did not the twelve should be deemed the murderers, and suffer severely for the crime committed. Question. What followed? Answer. They travelled as before, and, after many days of hardships and toil, on their return one of the brethren, more weary than the rest, sat down on the brow of a hill to rest and refresh himself, and on attempting to rise, accidentally caught hold of an acacia, which easily giving way, aroused his curiosity, upon which he hailed his companions, and on examination found it to be a grave. Question. What followed? Answer. At this time a party arrived with the ruffians, and related that, while sitting down to rest and refresh themselves, they heard the following horrid exclamations from the clefts of an adjacent rock. The first was the voice of Jubella, exclaiming, Oh! That my throat had been cut across, etc., etc. The second was the voice of Jubello, exclaiming, Oh! That my breast had been torn open, etc., etc. The third was the voice of Jubilum, exclaiming, Oh! That my body had been severed in two, my bowels taken from thence, etc etc. Upon which they rushed in, seized, bound, and brought them before King Solomon, who, after due conviction of their guilt, ordered them to be executed according to their several imprecations upon their own heads, uttered from the clefts of the rocks. Third section. Question. How long was the temple in building? Answer. Seven years. During which it rained not in the daytime, that the workmen might not be obstructed in their labor. Question. What supported the temple? Answer. 1453 columns, and 2906 pilasters. All hewn from the finest Parian marble. Question. What further supported it? Answer. Three grand columns or pillars. Question. What were they called? Answer. Wisdom, strength, and beauty. Question. What did they represent? Answer. The pillar of wisdom represented Solomon, king of Israel, whose wisdom contrived the mighty fabric. The pillar of strength, Hiram, king of Tyre, who strengthened Solomon in his grand undertaking. The pillar of beauty, Hiram Abiff, the widow's son, 
whose cunning craft and curious workmanship beautified and adorned the temple. Question. How many were there employed in the building of King Solomon's temple? Answer. Three grandmasters, 3,300 masters or overseers of the work, 80,000 fellow crafts, and 70,000 emptied apprentices, etc., etc. Question. How many constitute an emptied apprentice's lodge? Answer. Seven. One master and six entered apprentices. Question. Where did they usually meet? Answer. On the ground floor of King Solomon's temple. Question. How many constitute a fellow crafts lodge? Answer. Five. Two masters and three fellow crafts. Question. Where did they usually meet? Answer. In the middle chamber of King Solomon's temple. Question. How many constitute a master's lodge? Answer. Three master masons. Question. Where did they usually meet? Answer. In the sanctum sanctorum, or holy of holies, of King Solomon's temple. Question. Have you any emblems in this degree? Answer. We have several, and they are divided into two classes. Question. What are the first class? Answer. The pot of incense, the beehive. The book of constitutions guarded by the tiller's sword the sword pointing to a naked heart, the all-seeing eye, the angler and arc, the forty-seventh problem of Euclid, the hourglass, the scythe, and the three steps on the master's carpet. Question. How are they explained? These answers are monitorial. Question. What are the second class of emblems? Answer. The setting maul, spade, coffin, grave, and sprig of acacia, and are thus explained. Reader. I have given you the whole of the first three degrees in masonry. This ends the third, or master mason's degree. But few masons take sufficient interest in masonry to be advanced further, and consequently do not get the password which was lost by the tragical death of Hiram Abith. King Solomon is said to have substituted, in place of the lost one, the word now used in the master mason's degree, viz. Mahabone, which is given on the five points of fellowship, and in low breath. The missing word was found, after 470 years, and was then, and still is, used in the royal arch degree, as will be seen in the ceremonies of that degree. Closing the lodge. The lodge is closed in nearly the same manner that it is opened, and, in fact, all three of the degrees are closed alike. We will suppose the business of the lodge finished, and that the master proceeds to close. Worshipful Master. Brother Senior Warden. Do you know of anything further before this lodge of masons previous to closing? Senior Warden, rising to his feet, and giving the sign of a master mason, if opened on that degree. Nothing, worshipful, some say, in the west. Sits down. Worshipful master. Anything in the south, brother junior warden? Junior warden. Makes the same sign as the senior warden. Nothing, worshipful. Worshipful master. Brother secretary. Have you anything on your desk? Secretary. Nothing, worshipful. Worshipful master. Has any brother around the lodge anything to offer for the benefit of masonry before we proceed to close? Worshipful master. Reading of the present communication. Secretary reads the minutes, etc., etc. Worshipful master. Brother senior warden, have you any alterations or additions to make to the minutes? Senior warden rising to his feet and making the sign. I have none, worshipful. Worshipful master. Brother junior warden, have you any to make? Junior warden. None, worshipful. Worshipful master. Has any brother present any? Worshipful master. Brethren, the minutes will stand approved, if there are no objections. Gives one rap, when the junior deacon, at the inner door of the lodge, rises to his feet. Brother junior deacon. The last as well as the first care of masons, when convened? Junior deacon makes sign. To see that the lodge is duly dialed. Worshipful master. You will attend to that part of your duty, and inform the tiller that we are about to close this lodge, and direct him to dial accordingly. Deacon opens the door, and delivers his message. Junior deacon. The lodge is dialed, worshipful. Worshipful master. How dialed? Junior deacon. By a brother of this degree within the outer door. Worshipful master. His duty there? Junior deacon. 
to keep off all cowans and eavesdroppers, and suffer none to pass or repass, except such as are duly qualified and have the worshipful master's permission. Sits down. Worshipful master. One rap. Senior warden rises to his feet. Brother Senior Warden, at the opening of this lodge you informed me that you were a Master Mason. What induced you to become a Master Mason? Senior Warden. In order that I might travel in foreign countries, work, and receive Master's wages, being better enabled to support myself and family, and contribute to the relief of worthy distressed Master Masons, their widows and orphans. Worshipful Master. Have you ever traveled? Senior Warden. I have from west to east, and from east to west again. Some lodges use the following questions and answers, both at opening and closing, Worshipful Master. Why did you leave the west and travel to the east? Senior Warden. In search of that which was lost. Worshipful Master. To what do you allude, my brother? Senior Warden. The Master's word. Worshipful Master. Did you find it? Senior Warden. I did not but found the substitute. This is also used occasionally by some masters in the lecture, Worshipful Master. The Junior Deacon's Station? Senior Warden. At the right hand of the Senior Warden in the West. Worshipful Master. Two raps, or the officers rise to their feet. Your duty there, Brother Junior Deacon? Junior Deacon. To observe the approach of cowans and eavesdroppers and see that none ass or repus without the permission of the Worshipful Master in the East. Worshipful Master. The Senior Deacon's Station? Junior Deacon. At the right hand of the Worshipful Master in the East. Worshipful Master. Your duty there, Brother Senior Deacon? Worshipful Master. The Secretary's Station? S. Senior Deacon. At the left hand of the Worshipful Master in the East. Worshipful Master. Your duty there, Brother Secretary? Worshipful Master. The Treasurer's Station? Senior Deacon. At the left hand of the Worshipful Master in the East. Worshipful Master. Your duty there, Brother Treasurer? Worshipful Master. The Junior Warden's Station? Treasurer. In the South, Worshipful. Worshipful Master. Why in the South, on your duty there, Brother Junior? Worshipful Master. The Senior Warden's Station? Junior Warden. In the West, Worshipful Master. Worshipful Master. Why in the West, on your duty there, Brother Senior? Worshipful Master. The Worshipful Master's Station? Senior Warden. In the East, Worshipful. Worshipful Master. Why in the East, and his duty there? Senior Warden. As the sun rises in the East, to open and govern the day, so rises the Worshipful Master in the East. Here the Master gives three raps. Raps gavel times. When all in the lodge rise to their feet, the master rising first, to open and govern his lodge, set the craft to work, and give them proper instructions. Worshipful Master. Brother Senior Warden, it is my orders that this lodge be now closed, and stand closed until our next regular communication, barring emergency, when all, or a suitable number, shall have due and timely notice. In the meantime, it is hoped and expected that every brother will demean himself as becomes a man and a mason. This you will communicate to the junior warden in the south, and he to the brethren about the lodge, that they having due and timely notice, may govern themselves accordingly. Senior Warden. Brother Junior Warden, it is the orders of the worshipful master, etc., etc. Junior Warden. Brethren, you have heard the orders of the worshipful master as communicated to me through the senior warden in the West. You will take notice, and govern yourselves accordingly. Worshipful Master. Brethren, together on the signs. After the signs are gone through with by the whole lodge, the master gives one rap with his gavel, which is responded to by the senior warden, and then by the junior warden, and then again by the master, one rap. Senior Warden. One. Junior Warden. One. Again, the master. 1. Senior Warden. 1. Junior Warden. 1. Wrapping three times each. Worshipful Master. Brother Senior Warden, how should Masons meet? Senior Warden. On the level. Worshipful Master. And how act, Brother Junior? Junior Warden. On the plum. Worshipful Master. And part on the square. And so let us ever meet, act, and part. 
Master takes off his hat and repeats the following prayer. May the blessing of heaven rest upon us and all regular masons. May brotherly love prevail and every moral and social virtue cement us. Amen. Response. So mote it be. Charge at closing a lodge. Brethren, you are now about to quit this sacred retreat of friendship and virtue, to mix again with the world. Amid its concerns and temptations, forget not the duties you have heard so frequently inculcated and so forcibly recommended in this lodge. Be diligent, prudent, temperate, discreet. Remember that you have promised to befriend and relieve every brother who shall need your assistance. You have promised to remind him, in the most friendly manner, of his errors, and, if possible, to aid him in a reformation. These generous principles are to extend further. Every human being has a claim upon your kind offices. Do good unto all. Remember it more, especially to the household of the faithful. Finally, brethren, be ye all of one mind, live in peace, and may the God of love and peace delight to dwell with and bless you. Worshipful Master. Brother Senior Warden, I now declare this lodge duly closed. Brother Junior Deacon, turning to that officer, you will inform the tiller. Worshipful Master gives one rap with his gavel, when the lodge is closed, and the brethren divest themselves of their regalia, preparatory to returning to their respective homes. The work, or rather the lectures in the several degrees of masonry, more especially in the first three degrees, masonically termed the blue degrees, or blue lodge differ so much in each state that it would be a difficult thing to get exactly at the proper responses to some of the Masonic interrogatories. No three states in the Union work alike. Each Grand Lodge has a work of its own, which is taught the subordinate lodges annually by its Grand Lecturer. It is generally known among Masons that in the Northwestern states the lectures and work are those as taught by Barney. There is a great degree of uniformity in Michigan, Illinois, and Wisconsin also in Indiana and Iowa. The Barney work is that adopted by the Baltimore Convention. The work in Minnesota and New York is strongly impregnated with what is called, among Masons, Morganery. Very similar to the disclosures of Morgan and Richardson. So much so, that many masters purchase these publications for their instruction in their duties and in the ritual. Masonry has but little changed and a knowledge of the alterations which have been made since Morgan's exposure was written is all that is requisite to make a bright mason. The only alterations which occur in the lectures of each degree are in the commencement. A concise sketch of Brother Barney, the author of the three lectures introduced in this work, would not be out of place, as it will account to the reader for the difference existing between Masonic works in the several states, and in Europe, in the year 1817, Brother John Barney, formerly of Charlotte, Vermont, went to Boston, and obtained possession of the Preston Lectures, taught there by Gleason, and approved by the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts. With these lectures he returned to Vermont, and submitted them to the Grand Lodge, at its annual session in October, 1817. The subject was there referred for examination to a committee, which reported that these lectures were according to the most approved method of work in the United States and proposed to give Brother Barney letters of recommendation to all lodges and brethren in all parts as a brother well qualified to give Masonic information to any desirous of his services. This report of the committee was accepted and adopted by the Grand Lodge, and Brother Barney, provided with the recommendation thus obtained, visited many of the lodges of the state, and imparted to them a knowledge of these lectures. At this time Brother Barney wrote a portion of them in cipher. Subsequently to 1818, Brother Barney went to the western and southwestern states, and, being in delicate health, adopted the profession of Masonic lecturing as a means of subsistence. A few years afterward, on his return to his brethren in Vermont, he stated to them, as I have been credibly informed and believe, that he found in the western and southwestern states different systems of lecturing prevailing, and that, upon presenting Glesson's lectures to them, they were objected to by the different Grand Masters, who would not sanction his lecturing in their respective jurisdictions, unless he would adopt the lectures then in use among them. That, desiring to pursue his occupation there, he learned the different systems of lecturing existing among them, and made use of his newly acquired knowledge under the sanction of the respective Grand Masters. These facts will account for the want of agreement between the East and the West and Southwest, as to what are the true Barney lectures. From the foregoing remarks, 
it will be seen that the essential points of masonry are identical the world over, and that the differences, which are of minor importance, may be gathered by comparing the present work with Richard Sun's monitor or Ellen's ritual. The work known among masons as the web work, uninculcated by Robert Morris, is generally accepted as the work of ancient origin, and there is not much doubt but that it will be adopted by the Grand Lodges throughout the United States.